Hi, everyone. I now have it as 12 o'clock and we've got a lot to get through today. So we'll get started with our presentations. So first of all, to introduce myself, my name is Catherine Street. I'm the director of the Translational and Personalized Medicine Initiative here at Memorial. And I would like, you, like to thank you for joining Quality of Care NL, Newfoundland Support, and the Center for Health Informatics and Analytics for our one hour webinar about how our work pivoted to support the response to the COVID-19 pandemic here in Newfoundland and Labrador. During this session, you will learn about the process of data modeling and how it has helped inform decision-making regarding lockdown and the phased reopening of businesses and schools, et cetera, here within the province. You will also learn how our research has shifted to include global scans of pandemic responses and outcomes in jurisdictions similar to Newfoundland, jurisdictions such as Australia. I never knew until recently that Australia and Newfoundland were really that similar. And the third presentation will cover how patient partners are working with us to understand the impacts of COVID-19 restrictions on long-term care residents and their families throughout the province. Our first speaker today is Dr. Susan Stuckless. She is a research associate with Quality of Care and she specializes in statistics. Susan's presentation today is titled COVID-19 in Comparative Populations. Please note, we do have three presentations today but we, and there will be the opportunity for questions, but we'll save all the questions until after the third presentation. You will see on your screen a Q&A function so we ask that you write your questions in the Q&A function. So I will just give Susan control of the screen so she can start her presentation. All right. Well. Hi, uh, Catherine. Thanks for passing this over to me. Um, everyone can hear me okay? Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Okay, here we go. Um, yes, so part of the, uh, my work changed over with the uh, COVID pandemic and we have been doing some uh, work with the Department of Health and Community Services along with the modeling group and presenting uh, uh, data that we uh, looked at or collected uh, for comparator populations. And in this presentation, I'm just going to look at uh, three specific regions that we did look at. So what was our reasoning for undertaking this? Well, basically um, we wanted to monitor COVID-19 events and interventions that were taken um, in island communities similar to Newfoundland. So we looked at New Zealand, uh, Victoria uh, in Australia and Iceland. And we examined the actual events in real time. And this along with the modeling group uh, data, uh, we provided information for public health for their decision-making. <coughs> We collected data on the uh, incidence of new cases, along with a description of the various uh, types of interventions that were imposed or loosened uh, and from the government websites. And I, in this presentation, the data is about as up, is up to date to November 21st. Basically, there's two major elements that we've learned for COVID-19 control. And one is the prevention of importation of new cases and the management of new clusters. And within those clusters, uh, the events of interest that we uh, identified would be when the first case was identified in the community, uh, time to peak of the new cases. We also looked at time to flattening uh, the curve, which we classified as the first day um, after seven days without or with less than 10 new cases per million population a day. And we also looked at how long it would take to virus eradication, which would be 14 days um, without any new cases of community acquired infection. So I just wanted to show where we are in Newfoundland. Um, this graph basically, so on the, it's the number of cases per day. And as you can see, it's from the start of the pandemic back in March up until um, November 21st. And you can see we had our major cluster early on. Uh, we went, the state of emergency was declared. Um, and in all these, I will sh the lines will be the, um, I guess their alert levels or their restrictions when they were imposed or reimposed. 
And you can see, um, we obviously went into alert level four back in May. We went to alert level three um, early June, and we are currently still at alert level two. And all the peaks there, in most cases, up until very recently, have all been travel uh, related cases. So I just wanted to put that up to show where Newfoundland is right now. And basically for Newfoundland, um, the first case, as I said, was March the 14th. The peak took 11 days. Uh, the curve was flattened within 30, and virus was eradicated within 48 days. Um, and the mortality was 1.4%. So New Zealand was one of the first places that we decided to look at. Um, they were similar to ourselves. And as you can see, New Ze there's basically two separate clusters. We have the first cluster, which was back, began in uh, early February, up until around June, when they opened up to alert level one. And then they have, uh, since August, they had the second um, cluster uh, community cases. So New Zealand locked, went about a month and then they brought in border controls, their lockdown measures with uh, L4 being their highest level of lockdown. <clears throat> and then they went along for so, to level three, level two, level one. And as I said, they went then about 100, over 100 days without any uh, community acquired um, cases. These cases in between there were identified in their um, isolation and quarantine facilities. But then uh, a case was identified in the community early on in August, and they very quickly locked down. Um, specifically, they locked down more, they did a more regionalized approach because the cases were identified in Auckland. They locked down um, more extreme in Auckland itself and went back a level for the remainder of New Zealand. And I'll talk about now in the next slide, um, the next couple of slides, how that played out. So New Zealand, had their board, one of the things we looked at was border control. New Zealand's border is controlled by three interventions. They still have a travel ban, so you need specific uh, exemptions to get into the country. Uh, they have 14-day isolation in government facilities, and they get tested while in those facilities at day three and day 12 <clears throat> to ensure that no one goes into the community without, uh, with the infection. And as I said, they had because of this, they had eradicated the virus with over 100 days without any community transmission. And within those facilities, um, they've identified 315 cases. The majority were from June, the, since June the 9th when they um, went to alert level one. And within those facilities, 70% of the cases <clears throat> were diagnosed at around day three testing, but there were 30% at around day 12. So if they had been allowed to go out after their day five, say they tested at day five or day seven, they may not have been picked up because most were uh, not symptomatic. There was no evidence that once these people left managed isolation quarantine that they had transmitted it to the community. However, since November, there have been a couple cases where um, employees within those facilities have ended up positive and they're still trying to trace back the, um, the source of that. So for New Zealand, the first wave, <clears throat> the first case was like February 26, the peak was 28, the curve was flattened within 48 days, and the virus was eradicated um, within 80 days. And this compared to they, in their second wave, they, um, sorry, my computer screen seems to be screwed up here somewhat. Okay, sorry, here we go. Um, their first case was identified on August the 11th. Um, the peak was two days and the curve actually never went above 10 cases per million. So it was it stayed flattened and they eradicated within 58 days as opposed to um, 80 in the first. So they went hard and quick and then were able to eradicate the virus uh, quicker than their first wave. Then we, also, then we looked at Victoria. Australia, and again, you can see two distinct kind of an early on cluster and a later cluster. Um, and in the early one, they they went to a, a stage three restrictions were their highest, and then they eased some restrictions uh, early May, eased further restrictions um, in the end of May, early June. And then the community, they never did eradicate the virus and um, it ended up escaping into the community as well from their quarantine facilities. And then, um, so by the end of July, they started to have their um, community cases have increased severely and they brought in their, their strictest level of restrictions, I guess, which came in um, early August. And at that point, they actually declared a state of, um, a, uh, not a state, of, but a, 
state of disaster so that the police force could actually take control and ticket and people who weren't following public health measures. And basically by September, they had come in with a plan, a four step plan, which would be based on trigger points of um, cases per day, the number with an unknown origin, um, and all these trigger points had to be met before people could move down to stages. And again, similar to, to New Zealand, they did a more regionalized approach where, because most of the cases were in Melbourne, Metro Melbourne had their own uh, set of restrictions and steps and regional Victoria followed um, another set. And it wasn't until now the end of November that all of uh, Australia is at the last step of their, their uh, restrictions. So Victoria's border control, um, they were obtained by 14 day isolation in government facilities. Um, but the problem was back when uh, they still had some cases in the community, but the virus also escaped from these quarantine facilities. Uh, basically, the, they had hired staff from private companies. They were not necessarily fully trained on how things should have been done. The staff were co-mingling and this further led to um, the exacerbation of the, the community outbreak. So the, for the first wave, the peak was 62 days, the curve was flattened within 73, but the virus was never eradicated. So in the second uh, cluster, which began around early June, um, the peak was 58 days, the curve was flattened in 105, and the virus was eventually eradicated uh, within 165 days. They went close to 30 days now, I think, without any uh, new cases identified. But as you can, as from the graph before, you can see that the majority of um, Victoria's cases are, were in the second cluster. They only had about 8% of their cases uh, in the early cluster and 92% of their cases have been identified because of this uh, cluster outbreak that started back in early June. So for Vic Victoria, the issue with it was um, as well that they had a lot of non-compliance non-compli with public health, me health measures. Um, they put out a report back in, I think it was September, that showed as many as nine out of 10 people um, who tested positive were not self-isolating between the onset of symptoms and getting a test. And additionally, 53% of positive cases did not isolate between being tested and receiving their results. So this uh, led to community widespread uh, that kind of ran out of control. So they basically brought in what I had said, the state of disaster to allow uh, more police control to ticket those who weren't uh, following public health measures. So the last place we looked at uh, was Ice Iceland. They did things a little differently. New Zealand and Victoria, they um, set out guidelines or alert level stages, which were more specifically laid out and, um, and so included like gathering sizes, healthcare, businesses, schools. It was more of a formal plan. Iceland kind of uh, shut things down, but then they opened a majority, but it was mostly a lot of their, uh, when they restricted things again, was basically only on gathering sizes or high risk establishments like closing bars, pubs, um, restricting uh, the number of people that could enter gyms and those, those types of things. So their restriction levels, um, they're more of a, I guess, a reactive situation as opposed to a proactive set of guidelines and steps that were set out. Um, and as you can see again with Iceland, they had their distinct uh, first cluster um, very early on back in February when cases started. And then they never did eradicate the virus, but by early May, they had loosened many of their restrictions except for gathering size and a couple of things I'd said. And they actually were different than other places in that they opened up their borders in mid-June uh, to other members of the uh, European Union and stuff. And they were allowed to come in and just get a test. And if the test was negative, they were basically allowed to um, go into the community. But this obviously led to some issues and then cases started to get picked up. Uh, virus did get into the community and you can see the large uh, cluster now that they are dealing with currently. And similarly to uh, Victoria, a large majority of their 65% actually have been in this second cluster. 65% uh, of their cases are in this second large cluster. So Iceland's border control, um, as I said, they, they never did have a full travel ban as 
uh, people in the other European Union countries were allowed to enter Iceland. Um, they did have the 14 day isolation early on. Um, they did do testing on arrival, which came in in uh, June, mid June. And initially with that, they had no isolation. And I'll just discuss their little, uh, their actual border control measures in the next slide more in more detail. But since June the 15th, they've had uh, approximately 3,100 cases detected in the community and 371 at the border, but those community cases are likely related to um, their insecure border measures. They did find um, that basically many of the community cases were due to two strains that have been brought into uh, the country. I think they're a new one now, but back over the summer and into early fall, they were uh, traced back to two strains of the virus. And basically um, it took 20, um, the cluster that started on July the 26th, it took them um, a little over three weeks to actually in institute um, some more secure border prevention measures so that um, it virus wouldn't get escaped into the community. So as I said, um, they had, on June the 15th, they had uh, single testing at the border and send 14 day quarantine. And then after cases started getting in, they uh, brought in double testing on mid July, but only for citizens of Iceland and residents. And they had to do special precautions so they could still go out into the community, but in smaller gathering sizes. Um, they were told not to necessarily go to high risk places. Uh, but there weren't any, it wasn't a full isolation or quarantine, I guess, uh, with those. So in July 31st, um, it applied to all people coming into the country uh, that were going to be there for 10 days or more, <clears throat> and they had to undergo a second PCR test. Um, that, again, still didn't seem to be working. So by the 19th of August, they had required that all passengers would undergo double testing along with uh, um, a five to seven day uh, full isolation. So the events of interest, so I'm gonna scroll over here. I'm having some issue with one of my, the slides are, something is popping up on the screen, so that's why I'm a little slow here, sorry for that. Um, so basically for the first wave in Iceland, um, the peak was 25 days, the curve was flattened within um, 62 days, but again, as I said, the virus was never eradicated. Um, they are... For the second uh, cluster, the peak was 74 days. They still haven't flattened the curve. It's been about 120 days now, and the curve still hasn't, so they still haven't went below less than 10 per million per day. And the virus has not been eradicated. So what led to a lot of the, the huge cluster that was seen in Iceland? Well, they, um, uh, two tourists, basically they can trace back, this was in early, in uh, late September, they had violated isolation rules and at on September 22nd, they had could trace back a hundred uh, cases to these tourists that went out into the, the uh, entertainment night district, I guess, and had, and had spread it throughout bars and restaurants there. And they have also since June the 15th, 40% um, of those diagnosed uh, were not in quarantine at the time of diagnosis. So this again led to uh, further community spread. So conclusions, uh, border control to prevent the importation of cases depends on either uh, double testing at the border or 14 day isolation. Because as we can see, there was um, escape from isolation in Victoria and the failure to leave twice in Iceland led to um, large community outbreaks. The rapid, as in New Zealand, rapid imposition of lockdown uh, flattens the curve within a few days, but it's dependent on the adherence to the restrictions as Iceland and Victoria both show that poor adherence also led to further spread. And it is possible with rapid loosening of restrictions as New Zealand did to not be associated with new cases and you can rapidly reimpose restrictions to limit the cluster. So what does this mean for living with COVID-19? So what does the new normal look like in a community that has eradicated the virus? Well, basically you need to be able to control imported cases which would be double testing or 14 day isolation, and you need to be able to control a cluster. So there are with strong contact tracing, maybe include an app. Um, and in most cases, they do a locality approach where the um, restrictions would be dependent on the number of cases um, with 
ranging from physical distancing of masks to limited gathering sizes, school closures, et cetera. And it could be directed to a specific um, city or area um, and not necessarily uh, province or country statewide. It can be within a specific area. And another way places are looking at clusters as well is targeted wastewater testing. If a virus is found, they will do a uh, specific uh, testing blitz, I guess, in that area just to make sure that there's not a community cluster or that will break out. All right, thank you. Sorry for the slight delay there, just trying to get the computer systems working. So Susan, thank you so much for your excellent presentation there. I personally find it very reassuring that somebody is looking at what is happening in other countries so we as a province can learn from what, how they are managing things. But also because um, it just helps to inform our um, Chief Medical Officer of Health about what approaches to take next. So thank you for that. And I know you've been incredibly busy over the last how many months is it? Eight months trying to manage this data. So we appreciate that. So our next, our next presenter then is Paul Price. Paul is a senior systems administrator with the Center for Health Informatics and Analytics. And his presentation today is entitled COVID Simulation and Agent-Based Model. So Paul, I'll just try and give you control. You should have control now. Yeah, perfect. All right, thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Paul Price with the uh, Assistant Administrator here at uh, Chia, and uh, I give a presentation here on a agent-based model for the COVID-19 simulation. Uh, I will say that I, I am just one person, part of a much larger, uh, larger team who uh, did a lot of work on this. Um, so we, we have, my slides in the wrong order. So we do have a bunch of stakeholders, people who have a great interest in, in this work. So uh, four main ones, but there's subgroups under those. So we have Memorial University, uh, University of Toronto, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, IBM, who is a uh, partner with us here at uh, CHIA. And of course, our, our own government, government of Newfoundland and Labrador. And of course, by uh, extension with the uh, government, we have the um, our regional health authorities and, of course, uh, uh, Nilchi, who uh, supplies our, our data. Um, as we can see, uh, in the beginning in March, we, we had a very large spike uh, cluster happening. So we had to, you know, what, what can we do to, to help the government to make informed decisions and that and to try to uh, contain this and, and get this uh, under control? Uh, and as you can see, the, the curve on the other side, uh, you know, the stuff that the government did and everything we did here in Newfoundland did start to uh, bring it back down again. So uh, under the leadership of uh, Dr. Proton uh, Raman, um, he uh, reached out to Dr. Uh, Diane Allman from the University of Toronto. So that's where our connection to the uh, U of T is to. Um, back in, um, H1N1, uh, Dr. Allman had a, um, this MORPOP uh, application design for, for doing uh, pandemic outbreak uh, planning and agent-based simulation. Uh, of course, it, uh, it wasn't uh, ever really finished because the, uh, the vaccine came out and H1N1 kind of cleared up. So it was, uh, you know, it was a product, but uh, uh, it needed uh, more work to be done and also to be uh, applied to Newfoundland. So uh, he reached out to uh, Dr. Allman and uh, about partnering uh, with uh, with us here at the university and of course uh, with the, the government uh, to do some modeling uh, for for us and, uh, and we would support uh, of course the work in whatever way uh, we could. And from my point of view that meant uh, using our, our cluster that we have here with uh, many CPUs and, and memory to uh, to allow the simulations to uh, to be run, so the yeah, it's the it was MORPOP, which is the uh, Medical uh, Operations Research Lab Pandemic Outbreak Planner. It's a agent-based simulation for uh, pandemic uh, disease spread, where uh, each individual in the population uh, is an agent in the uh, in the simulation. 
And uh, you can use this, uh, this model to answer um, uh, essentially what if uh, scenarios. Um, so this computer-based model can uh, simulate uh, disease spread through a population, uh, use graph theory to uh, optimize public health um, uh, policies for the purpose of uh, mitigating outbreak impact uh, and answer, uh, like I say, the what if scenarios. And so some of those questions that we can, we can answer is, uh, uh, you know, when should we close schools? Um, you know, what policy works better and by how much? Uh, uh, the big one, should we allow travelers in the Newfoundland? Um, there, we can also do modeling later when asked the questions of uh, the vaccine. So uh, if, you know, how effective is a 95% effective vaccine compared to a 98%? Um, is uh, creating a flu center uh, worth the costs and resources of a city? Uh, we, can, we can model all of these to, to give a result to make decisions or to at least be one, one person in the, in the decision-making process. Uh, so it was, uh, the problem with the, the as it stood uh, in the beginning was it was originally built, like I say, in 2009 for H1N1. Um, it was in collaboration with uh, the Ontario Health uh, uh, Protection uh, Group. So, uh, and it was used to model the uh, GTA, the greater Toronto area, which was 6 million people. So we needed to adopt this to Newfoundland uh, and we had to make some changes. Uh, for instance, uh, Newfoundland doesn't have subway systems, so uh, that wouldn't be of, of any uh, importance to us. And, uh, and especially in the very beginning, uh, even with our public transit, it was pretty much non-existent. Uh, with five people riding a bus at a time, it didn't, uh, it was, uh, it didn't really matter if we, if we included that in the model or not really. Uh, and we didn't have a vaccine, uh, whereas H1N1 had a vaccine very quickly. So the, uh, it was, like I say, it was unfinished. So uh, it would need to be uh, finished development and applied to Newfoundland. Um, they needed a large uh, amount of uh, computing to run uh, many, many simulations. And they would also need uh, compute nodes with a memory greater than 64 gigabytes. So uh, we have some that are at 256, which came in, uh, in great use. Uh, they also needed uh, to be, uh, be responsive and a quick action from the competition of support. So uh, we were there through the, the whole thing to provide support and uh, get things done in a, in a quickly manner. So here at Chia and with our partner IBM, we uh, these are the contributions that we uh, we made to the uh, to the project. So uh, you know we we supplied the CPU cycles. We supplied the large memory compute nodes. Um, we already had an agreement in place with Nilchi for uh, storing data and transferring data. So that made that uh, very uh, uh, easy and uh, fast to, uh, to obtain the data that was needed. Uh, we're already approved for storing private and sensitive data here. Uh, through IBM, we gain access to a uh, full stack uh, developer. Um, through IBM on the local Chia team, uh, we have Dr. Randy uh, Giffen who is the health solutions uh, architect. So we had access to him. And also IBM uh, provided a, a data scientist and C++ uh, programmer to work on it, and, uh, Sean Wagner, Dr. Sean Wagner. Uh, so that was a great help and uh, expedited the development of it, uh, you know, tenfold or more. It was very, very uh, great to see the partnership uh, unfold. Uh, so why, why use this model for, for Newfoundland? Well, we're able to compare uh, disease spread across the proposed changes we make. So we can, uh, so effective policies are identified, allowing uh, the public health officials and the government to make uh, evidence-based decisions. Um, and with this, this model, uh, compared to other agent-based models, we're able to simulate, you know, uh, the population, which is 520,000 agents or people. Uh, and each 100-day simulation only requires about 25 seconds uh, to run. So uh, we're able to uh, run many, many 100-day uh, simulations to uh, find patterns uh, fairly, fairly quickly compared to uh, some, other, uh, some other models. Um, like I said, in Newfoundland Labrador, there's about 520,000 agents. Uh, so individuals are uh, uh, interacted in the various environments and each infection contact uh, increase the uh, probability of infection. 
Uh, individuals potentially change behaviors to self-isolate or they will seek medical care when symptomatic. By comparing the resulting disease spread across proposed school uh, mitigation measures, uh, including physical distancing and masks, effective policies, like I say, could be uh, identified and uh, applied. And uh, by running the models in different scenarios, we can see how uh, effective uh, they are. So how do we go about, uh, about doing this? So uh, we needed to adapt it to, uh, to here in, in Newfoundland. Uh, and we also, uh, in doing that uh, and adapting it to Newfoundland, we want to adapt it in a way that uh, not only will it work in Newfoundland, but uh, in the future, we can uh, make this easily extendable to other locations or, or even other uh, diseases uh, so that we can quickly uh, roll it out again. Uh, we need to seek the uh, expertise in, in the field and uh, technology. And uh, that's what we did through our partnership with IBM and uh, U of T. And of course, with uh, the government, uh, Eastern Health, uh, even uh, statistics in Newfoundland for school information. So we, we quickly got uh, access to all that. And I think it was less than two months we, we collected all the, all, all the data through the different uh, groups like uh, NILCHI and statistics and, and uh, Eastern Health. Uh, so we, what, we, what do we need to identify uh, to do this? We need to know the, the people, uh, how our population is made up of, uh, their location in their uh, uh, census uh, area or, their, or by regional health authority. We need to know how old they are. We need to know uh, their comorbidities, uh, whether we have out-of-province travelers. Uh, we also need to know uh, what our households are made up of, how many people live in a household on average. <clears throat> Uh, where the workplaces are, where they travel for work, how our schools are divided up and, and where people go to school to, uh, our hospitals, uh, how many are in the hospital currently and uh, you know, if we're doing elective surgeries or not, um, and how are they hospitalized? Um, and what, what are the random community contacts that we, we have uh, in your day-to-day -day as you go about your day? We also need to know the, uh, the, the parameters of the disease. So the you know, transmission rate per minute per age group. So, uh, um, and death rate. Uh, so what's the corability of the disease? Uh, you know, if you're pre-symptomatic, how contagious are you? And the percentage of asymptomatic people in the field. Plus other, there's other uh, things that we can model into it. Uh, and of course, as we were doing the, uh, the modeling, uh, things changed. Uh, we were asked new questions and we essentially had to uh, add in uh, new variables and uh, rerun the models to give uh, new answers. Uh, we also need to know about the public policies uh, in the models. Like I say, uh, uh, school closures, you know, what, uh, what parameters are required to close a school or to be just uh, quarantine a classroom or a cohort. Um, about quarantining and self-isolation, like with our, our rotational workers and if someone is infected. Um, workplace closures, uh, only leaving essential businesses open, stuff like that. Uh, and then of course, uh, when we get a vaccine and how effective it is, and then we can model uh, how well doing the different priorities, um, like you know, maybe frontline workers get, uh, get it first. Well, we don't know the answer to all that, but we can run that in a model and, uh, and, and give uh, you know, one, one opinion essentially that uh, marks other opinions that the government and public health will get. Uh, to make a decision on uh, how to prioritize it. Um, contact uh, tracing, uh, of course, I think we all agree and know here in Newfoundland, we have some of the best contact tracing probably in the world. I think uh, last I heard, it was something like 96% uh, contact tracing and that allows us to get the, the little clusters under control very quickly. But either way, we need to know what that uh, capture rate is and uh, and what our limitations are of, uh, of contact tracing. We've only got so many people and we can only make so many phone calls in, the, in a day to do the tracing. So it still takes time uh, to do that, uh, that tracing. Uh, so we needed to collect the data. As I said, uh, thanks to all the provincial support uh, and the different groups in the government, um, we, uh, we gathered this data in less than, less than two months. Uh, there were cases where we didn't have data available, so we had to make uh, expert uh, guesses. Um, of course, um, sometimes the data is not available in the beginning, it becomes available later. So we go back and rework it. Sometimes the, the guesses were spot on, sometimes they had to be tweaked uh, a little bit. Uh, so uh, some, of the, some of the guesses well, we had to we have to make an expert guess in uh, what the infection traveler rate is. So what's the, you know, what do you think uh, the rate of infected travelers are if we let the uh, border stay open for, for, for modeling purposes? Um, 
We assume that if someone is sick, that they will stay home and isolate, uh, stuff like that. Um, there was there was some mismatching between uh, census data and the uh, the actual kids' age in school, so we had to kind of uh, fix that and make assumptions uh, where needed. And so it's really, this is all about, uh, like I said, is creating a, a common uh, sandbox uh, to do what if. So uh, you, answer, you ask a bunch of questions, you know, what if we do this? What if we do that? You know, if, uh, what if we do nothing, what happens? Uh, so we can turn all those parameters on and uh, we run it a whole lot of times on the, uh, the computers and then we, we plot it out to see what it looks like. For instance, uh, in this case here, this is a uh, running of, um, uh, using uh, so we got full school cohorts uh, with masks and uh, this is for uh, a junior and senior high so uh, we in this graph here we show that uh, if you uh, all wear masks in intermediate and senior high um, what, what your active cases are and then with social distancing with masks and uh, you see it, it brings it down a lot more. And uh, even imperfect wearing uh, with social distancing with the masks is still better than, uh, than not having the mask on at all. You see it does level out and flatten here. Uh, another example uh, is our household bubbles and how well you stick to them. Um, you can see see here so three bubbles uh, in perfect you know it, it does peak but it's about the same but uh the better you, you know smaller bubbles uh, are and uh, even a little bit imperfect in smarls it does level out and uh, and is contained uh based on this and this data so uh when we run the uh the simulations and in, in the computer essentially it spits out numbers that uh aren't really great for anyone uh, we have to visualize it somehow so in, uh, to do that, to allow people to see, to see you know, what the outcomes are, we uh, have a dashboard. And this is where the, uh, the full, essentially the full stack developer from IBM uh, came into uh, a, great, uh, a great need here and uh, did a great job. Uh, so uh, essentially we can, um, we can upload uh, the simulation in what's called a JSON format and um, we can simulate it and show it here on the screen. And the, uh, the input parameters are listed and it will give you uh, your little graphs down below and you can do some, some stuff you can click on to change to see, you know, the number of people that were hospitalized or dead and, and I'll tell you what your max infection rates were and stuff like that based on your parameters that uh, were inputted in the uh, simulation. Uh, another dashboard that, uh, that was uh, looked at was uh, showing, uh, you know, different clusters or infections in the uh, different, either, you know, uh, re regional areas, the uh, census data areas, or depending on however you want to break it up. As you can see here, um, we have a similar uh, thing, just visualizing it a little differently to, uh, to help the people who need to make decisions uh, be able to uh, make the proper, uh, proper decisions, hopefully. And uh, it seems like we are, we are doing that uh, quite well. And that's it for my talk. Thank you. Sorry, Robert, I was giving away your slides there accidentally as I was trying well, to well, well. back. Um, thank you, Paul, for your presentation there. It's really good to see how all the different agencies have come together to facilitate a piece of work like that. So Memorial University through CHIA, and I believe other departments within Memorial, the Centre for Health Information, IBM, and then working across to the University of Toronto. So that's really good to see. And I do hope the modelling will help us work out whether that 95% effective vaccine that anyone's talking about will be the answer to all of our problems. So our next presentation presenter and our last presenter, presenter but not late, not least, is Dr. Robert Wilson. Robert is a research associate and scientific lead for Newfoundland Support. Robert's presentation today is entitled The Impact of COVID-19 Isolation on Long-Term Care Residents and Their Families in Newfoundland and Labrador. Just before I hand the control over to Robert, I want to apologize if you're getting a a pop-up popping up on your screen. We do not know what is causing that, so my apologies for that. 
and I hope it does, hasn't detract, distracted you too much from the presentations. Robert, I'll just give you control. Perfect, thanks, Catherine. So I should actually mention before I start that this is an NL support, uh, Newfoundland support um, uh, led project. Um, it's, it's not actually, um, it's, it's actually driven. Uh, the idea was actually come from a patient advisory council or lovely patient advisory council. The idea came from it and it's actually not even, it's beyond oriented research. Um, it's actually driven and led by the patients. So uh, just to give you a background uh, of why this is such uh, an important topic. Um, so the frail elderly who occupy most of long-term care facilities are at much higher risk of adverse outcomes if, if COVID-19 has um, uh, infiltrated the facilities. Uh, Long-term care facilities are conducive to rapid spread and that's just the way they're built. They're, there's a lot of common, um, common shared spaces within these facilities and also there's a lot of close, close contact between um, staff and residents uh, just be due to the care needs. So there is um, a, a functional decline of ADLs and cognitive impair impairment in residents makes certain uh, precautions and social isolations for distancing quite difficult uh, in these facilities. So you can imagine meaning that residents who need a lot of assistance, there's gonna be a lot of close contact between um, nurses or LPNs or whoever's providing that, uh, that care to those um, residents um, well, within this uh, pandemic. Also, if you can imagine those with cognitive impairments such as um, dementia or Alzheimer's, trying to enforce these restrictions on these residents, it can be quite difficult. <laughs> So uh, I'm just gonna give you a few stats of why this is such uh, an important issue, um, because the fact is, is that long-term care was the major headline early within this pandemic, once it hit Canada. So 18% of Canadian long-term care facilities have had an outbreak. Now this information came around May when, when we had our, our sort of peak outbreak. 30% of all the cases were affected, either residents or staff. So it wasn't just residents. It was those who, uh, who were taking care, which caused more issues. And of course, 81% 80, of all deaths were attributed to long-term care facility cases. So I know this is kind of a busy slide, but I just want you to focus more on the very last column um, and last row. So basically, I'm just kind of trying to emphasize the amount, the percentage of deaths that were attributed just to long-term care in Canada. So this is overall deaths in Canada for COVID-19. 81% were attributed to those uh, within long-term care, either residents or staff. So once again, this just emphasizes um, the deaths from residents in long-term care and reti retirement homes. So it was a major headline. So the, the issue with, with that is that the healthcare system, um, once this pandemic kind of started uh, once the WHO uh, released the information that this was a pandemic, the healthcare system in Canada tried to uh, rapidly prepare itself. So what they did was they overprepared in hospitals, meaning that they tried to empty beds in, um, in basically projecting influx of COVID-19 patients coming in that would occupy it in within their wards and their CCU and ICU. So the issue with that is that they, they kind of neglected one big sector of the healthcare system, and that was long-term care. And so one of the major issues is that once the virus came in here, there was workers that worked in multiple nursing homes and sites. So once the virus went in, there was workers that were bringing it towards other, um, other facilities. Um, along with that, uh, most of the facilities weren't actually properly trained, that being the residents and the staff and they, were, they weren't properly equipped with uh, uh, PPEs. So it came so bad that uh, actually in Ontario that they actually needed military to come in and provide some help within some of these um, um, uh, long-term care facilities or, or nursing homes. And you can perhaps uh, uh, Google later on that the, the military actually provided a report um, uh, to the public. So obviously once this kind of got really out of hand, it was headlines in the news, uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada actually started releasing guidelines. Um, so uh, I'm not gonna go through all this. Basically it was just to enforce into all these long-term care facilities. So pretty much um, when this got out of hand, long-term care facilities were on lockdown. Um, there was only uh, essential visitors that were actually allowed in. And, and of course, perhaps in, in most facilities, 
you had to go through a lot of measures and barriers and hoops to uh, allow access to uh, see a resident or a loved one within these facilities. And I've kind of mentioned this before, this is a, just kind of emphasizing the fact that, um, you know, long-term care residents are, are vulnerable population. And uh, a lot of these facilities are, um, once the, it, the virus kind of inf infiltrates the, the facility, it's gonna spread rapidly. So why this is the why this um, I guess project is is very important. The rationale behind it is that families are actually an integral part of care um, for residents. It's not just provided by staff. Um, family members and loved ones um, provide supplement care to residents. Um, they're actually surrogate decision makers, and they actually are care coordinators. They're they're uh, an integral part in in the center of care for long term care residents. So now that kind of that uh, help has been um, taken away from the long-term care facilities within this lockdown, um, staff are actually under quite a bit of pressure now. So not only are they missing out on this help, they're under quite uh, a lot of restrictions and barriers to provide the proper care that was given before to these residents. So you can see that the, this, this problem is, is escalating. So, so to focus in more on the residents, um, they're, they're under quite a bit of social isolation now. They're missing out on that kind of close contact between staff and they're missing out on that close contact between their actual uh, family, uh, I could say family members or loved ones, whoever that visitor was that provided that care and, and um, social um, aspect uh, to that resident. Um, so decline in, in residents' mental and physical health can actually be exasperated by social isolation. And then you can start getting into sort of things of, of depression. So with that being said, a decline in physical and mental health, this is going to even exasperate the problem even more because now they're actually going to even need more care from staff um, and more one-on-one -on -one time, which is still now restricted due to um, uh, the, uh, the COVID-19. So basically, our project kind of wants to look into um, providing information to, I guess, um, government and perhaps looking at um, more regulations and, and, and more uh, implying policies because there actually has to be a balance between A, resident safety. We actually have to protect these vulnerable population, but there actually has to be a, a, a healthy balance of their quality of life because the long-term care residents actually don't um, you know, particularly the frail elderly are, are not surviving long within these facilities. The average time or length of stay is probably maximum up to a year. So you can imagine in, in this COVID period right now, we're looking at March now going into December, we're almost looking for a year. So you could imagine that there's a lot of these residents that actually never got one-on-one -on -one time with their family members and perhaps passed away. So what is our objective here? It's going to be kind of twofold. So what we want to do is examine changes in depression, anxiety, cognitive impairment, uh, drug use, restraints, um, uh, mortality, um, and just due to the pre and post confinement of long-term residents due to COVID. So we're actually going to actually um, um, fill in an application to Nauchi to provide us with what is the MDS 2.0. The Rye MDS 2.0. So this is a resident uh, assessment instrument, and this looks at the actual mental and physical um, uh, indicators that is collected uh, on residents on their entry and on a quarterly basis. So what else we want to do? We want to examine changes in indicators of physical health, frailty and health, instability of long-term care residents pre and post COVID, um, measure subjective changes in long-term care residents, uh, mental and physical health and well-being as perceived by residents of long-term care facilities and their families, and explore the overall experiences of long-term care residents and family members or caregivers during the COVID-19. And so the way we're gonna do actually do this is uh, survey. So we're gonna provide two sort of surveys. One survey will focus in on the residents and one, one will actually focus in on the family members. And so our idea is to get their actual perspective uh, and their experience during this COVID period um, and then kind of complement that with um, information that is coming from the MDS with their actual assessment of physical and mental health that is done by a staff member. So that's it. That's all I have.
Thank you for that uh, presentation, Robert. It really is an important area of um, investigation to see what has happened to the residents of long-term care homes during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And we often think of residents of long-term care homes as just being elderly, but it's important to note that we also have a number of young people in there as well. So thank you for that, Robert, and I hope that the work goes forward well. So that brings us to the end of the formal presentation. So I'm going to stop the screen share so we hopefully get rid of that pop-up that keeps popping up. And also just want to ask if anyone has any questions they'd like to put in the question and answer function. I see we have some things in the chat, so just let me check those. Nope, nothing of relevance there. So while we wait for other questions to come in, Robert, I have a question for you. You're talking about doing uh, surveys of residents and um, their families in respect of their experiences during COVID-19. Do you think we should be looking at doing regular surveys of, of residents and their families just to understand how they feel about this, about long-term care and where care could be improved? Yeah, actually, that's a good question. So, I mean, um, I, I think that is an actual project and idea that is um, up and coming. However, I think perhaps that this would be kind of um, hopefully post COVID because um, that COVID-19 lens would have um, a bit of a, it would put a bit of a, you know, uh, an asterisk on the results that would come from this uh, information. Okay. I'm just going to throw it out to attendees if anyone has any questions or if any of our panelists have questions for their colleagues, please feel free to raise those. We've got, we've got a very quiet group of attendees. So if there aren't any questions from our attendees, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank our presenters again for presenting today. There were certainly three very interesting areas of work. I'd also like to thank all of our attendees for joining us today, and we hope that you found the session enjoyable and informative. And I also like to give a thank you to Memorial University for hosting Research Week. It's so important that um, staff, researchers, faculty in, in different disciplines un understand and begin to learn about the work that's happening across Memorial, because it's only by doing that that we are able to sort of co-learn, if, if there's not a better word for that, and make those connections with other faculty. So I would like to thank Memorial for hosting Research Week and to say that we were delighted to take the opportunity to share our work, and we hope to be invited back again next, next year. So if there's no other questions, uh, we will close the session for today. Thank you.